Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Vincent Tejesis, and I'm pleased to have the opportunity to talk to you today about label claims related to nutrition that are regulated by the FDA. First up, we have a question about everyone's knowledge of nutrition claims. We're going to take a poll, poll of the audience, try to discuss this with others at your site to figure out the right answer. Is the following statement true or false? The science behind each label claim made on a conventional food or dietary supplement package is reviewed and the language is approved by FDA. We'll come back to the poll for an answer in a little bit. Okay, so FDA derives its authority to regulate label claims from amendments to the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act that were made in 1990 when the Nutrition Labeling and Education Act was signed into law and also from case law meaning court cases. NLEA provided the basis for the modern food label with the goals of assisting consumers in maintaining healthy dietary practices, providing a level playing field for claims, and encouraging innovations in food products. NLEA provided for the mandatory nutrition facts label, as well as voluntary nutrient content claims when they are defined by FDA and health claims when they are authorized by FDA. And back to our poll question. The answer is false. It looks like most of you, 78%, got the answer correct, so you're pretty well acquainted with uh, the nutrition claims uh, that we regulate. Um, so FDA doesn't review the science behind each label claim made on conventional food or dietary supplement packages. And we do not approve the language used in all claims prior to the food being sold in the marketplace. We're going to talk today about the various types of label claims, and hopefully, by the end of the presentation, you will be able to tell which ones are reviewed and approved prior to showing up in the marketplace. The types of label claims that I'm going to discuss include health claims, including authorized health claims that meet our standard of significant scientific agreement, qualified health claims, and claims made in accordance with the FDA Modernization Act of 1997, otherwise known as FDAMA. Nutrient content claims, which can be defined by FDA in regulation or may be used if they meet FDAMA requirements, and structure function claims. A health claim is an express or implied statement in food labeling about the relationship of a food substance to a disease or health-related condition. Health claims cannot be just any claim about health. Some claims about health may be considered drug claims. Authorized health claims and qualified health claims do require pre-approval by FDA. We will talk a little bit about FDAMA claims later in the presentation, but industry must notify FDA of the use of health claims that meet the FDAMA requirements before they are marketed. Health claims can be used on conventional foods and dietary supplements. The relationship between the substance and disease should be a causal, causal relationship demonstrating that the substance has an effect of reducing the risk of a disease or health-related condition in the U.S. population or subpopulation. Health claims are not about treating, preventing, curing, or mitigating a disease. Those types of claims would be considered drug claims. And there are two elements of a health claim. One, a substance which is a specific food such as a tomato or a component of food such as lycopene and it can be in the form of a conventional food or dietary supplement. And two, a disease or health related condition where disease is defined as damage to an organ, structure or system of the body such that it does not function properly such as coronary heart disease or a state of health leading to such dysfunction such as hypertension. NLEA permits authorization only when FDA has determined, based on the totality of publicly available scientific evidence, that there is significant scientific agreement, usually referred to as SSA, that the claim is supported by such evidence. The agency has a process for reviewing the scientific evidence to determine whether it meets the SSA standard. That process is outlined in a guidance document on FDA's evidence-based review system for the scientific evaluation of health claims. If you are interested in learning more about how FDA evaluates the scientific evidence, you can visit the link provided in this slide. 
health claims that meet the SSA standard are authorized through regulation. If after review of the scientific evidence, FDA determines that the scientific evidence does not meet our SSA standard, we may choose to allow for the use of a qualified health claim. And I will explain more about qualified health claims next. And here's a list of some of our authorized regulations. For, for more information about all of the health claims that, that have been authorized by regulation by FDA, you can visit our website at the link provided on this slide. A court case in 1999 changed the landscape for health claims and paved the way for qualified health claims. The lawsuit was based on an FDA decision to not authorize four health claims for dietary supplements on the basis of the significant scientific agreement standard. The court concluded in that case that the First Amendment does not permit FDA to prohibit health claims that are only potentially misleading, unless the agency reasonably determines that no disclaimer would eliminate the potential deception. In other words, if you can qualify the claim with a disclaimer, the claim cannot be prohibited. Thus, qualified health claims are based on credible evidence that does not meet the SSA standard and can be used to describe relationships between a substance and a disease for which there is more limited scientific evidence. If FDA reviews this scientific evidence and determines that there is some evidence to support the claim, but not enough to meet the SSA bar, we may issue a letter to the individual group that submitted the health claim petition called a letter of enforcement discretion. A letter of enforcement discretion is a letter saying that the FDA will choose not to take enforcement action if the requirements stated in the letter are met. For qualified health claims, FDA provides the specific language that must be used for the claim in the letter of enforcement discretion. Here's an example of a qualified health claim for monounsaturated fatty acids from olive oil and risk of coronary heart disease. You will see that the qualifying language talks about the strength of the evidence where it says limited and not conclusive scientific evidence suggests. Here's a list of some qualified health claims that may be used in food labeling. For a full list of qualified health claims, you can visit the link provided in this slide. Okay, on to nutrient content claims. A nutrient content claim is any claim used in the labeling of foods that expressly or by implication characterizes the level of a nutrient in the food. Nutrient content claims are defined by regulation and require pre-approval by FDA. Some examples of nutrient content claims are Express claims such as free, comparative claims such as more or reduced, use of the term healthy in labeling is also considered a nutrient content claim, and simple amount or percent claims are considered nutrient content claims as well. There's a link, uh, also a link provided on this slide to find out more information about these types of claims. If a nutrient content claim is made on a food that exceeds prescribed levels of total fat, saturated fat, cholesterol, or sodium, a disclosure statement must be made. The disclosure statement alerts the consumer that the food exceeds one or more of the nutrients. An example of the disclaimer language is see nutrition information for saturated fat content. The disclosure levels are 13 grams uh, of total fat, 4 grams of saturated fat, 60 milligrams of cholesterol, and 480 milligrams of sodium, typically per reference amount customarily consumed and per labeled serving. There are express and implied nutrient content claims, and there are two types of express nutrient content claims, and they are absolute and relative claims. Absolute claims describe the level of a nutrient in a product, while relative claims compare the level of a nutrient in a food to that of another food. Some examples of absolute claims are free, low, good source, and excellent source. Free and low depend on the nutrient. For example, to be fat-free, the product has to contain less than 5 grams of fat per rack and per labeled serving. To be sodium-free, the product must contain less than 5 milligrams of sodium per rack and per labeled serving size. To use a good source claim, a food must contain between 10 to 19% of the daily value of a nutrient per rack 
and an excellent source claim can be used on foods that contain 20% or more of the daily value of a nutrient per rack. And here are some examples of relative claims. For example, a reduced claim could be used if the product has at least 25% less of a nutrient per rack compared to an appropriate reference food. An appropriate reference food is a food or group of foods that are representative of the same type as the food bearing the claim. For example, potato chips could be used as a reference food for pretzels because they are both snack foods of the same type. A product may bear a more claim if it contains at least 10% more of the daily value of a nutrient per rack than an appropriate reference food. As I mentioned earlier, other than express claims, there are also implied nutrient content claims. There are different types of implied nutrient content claims, and they include those that suggest a nutrient is present or absent in a certain amount. For example, a statement that a product contains no oil can imply that the product is fat-free. Uh, those that suggest the food can help maintain healthy dietary practices. And there are also equivalence claims. An example of an equivalence claim is contains as much vitamin C as an 8-ounce glass of orange juice. The term healthy and any of its derivatives, such as health or healthful, are implied nutrient content claims that suggest that the food, because of its nutrient content, may be useful in maintaining healthy dietary practices. Foods that include the use of the term healthy or any of its synonyms in labeling must meet these requirements for total fat, saturated fat, sodium, cholesterol, and, and certain beneficial nutrients. As you can see, the requirements are typically 3 grams or less of total fat, 1 gram or less of saturated fat, 480 milligrams or less of sodium, and 60 milligrams or less of cholesterol, and at least 10% of the DV for certain beneficial nutrients. Claims about the amount of a nutrient are permitted without pre-approval, provided that the statement does not implicitly characterize the level, like good source or low, of a nutrient in a product. Examples of amount statements include 100 calories or 5 grams of carbohydrates. Also, no authorization is needed for statements that describe the percentage of a vitamin or mineral in a food in relation to the DV. For example, a product may bear, may bear a statement that it contains 60% of the DV for vitamin C. In 1997, the FDA Modernization Act amended the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act to allow for claims to be made in the labeling of foods that are based on authoritative statements from appropriate scientific bodies. Authoritative statements are key statements from consensus reports developed by certain federal scientific bodies and the Institute of Medicine. An example of an authoritative statement would be one of the key recommendations from the Dietary Guidelines for Americans. Authoritative statements about nutrition represent scientific knowledge that is well accepted by the scientific community and do not represent emerging science. FADAMA provides an alternative notification process to the petition process for health claims and nutrient content claims. And the intent of FADAMA is to expedite the health claim and nutrient content claim review process so that the consumer can benefit from the information. One example of a claim authorized by FDA through FADAMA would be the health claim for potassium and reduced risk of high blood pressure and stroke. Structure function claims have historically appeared on the labels of conventional foods and dietary supplements. However, the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act of 1994, usually referred to as DSHEA, established some special regulatory procedures for such claims for dietary supplement labels. Structure function claims describe the role of a nutrient or dietary ingredient intended to affect normal structure or functions in humans. For example, calcium builds strong bones. In addition, they may characterize the means by which a nutrient or dietary ingredient acts to maintain such structure or function. 
For example, fiber maintains bowel regularity. These claims may also describe general well-being from consumption of a nutrient or dietary ingredient. Structure function claims may also describe a benefit related to a nutrient deficiency disease, like vitamin C and scurvy, as long as the statement also tells how widespread such a disease is in the United States. The manufacturer is responsible for ensuring the accuracy and truthfulness of these claims. They are not pre-approved by FDA, but must be truthful and not misleading. If a dietary supplement label includes such a claim, it must state in a disclaimer that FDA has not evaluated the claim. The disclaimer must also state that the dietary supplement product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease, because only a drug can legally make such a claim. Manufacturers of dietary supplements that make structure function claims in labeling must submit a notification to FDA no later than 30 days after marketing the dietary supplement that includes the text of the structure function claim. And more information on structure function claims can be found at the website listed on this slide. And so with that, I think I'm done, uh, and thank you for joining our webinar today. There may, might be some time for, for a few questions, and we'll see if we received any. I want to say thank you very much for that wonderful ex explanation of nutrient con our labeling claims as well as all of the different kinds of label claims, uh, Vinny. Thank you very much. We do have some questions uh, that we uh, will have some time to answer. Uh, the first question has to do with the qualified health claim. Uh, can a health claim that attributes the same benefit to two or more uh, different nutrients require the same disclaimer? And be, uh, could that be combined on a label so that you're only listing it one time? In other words, if you say vitamin C or vitamin E uh, re related to the reduction of heart disease or something like that, or cancer, can you combine them into one statement on the label? So when we talked about the elements of uh, a health claim, we, there were two elements, the, the substance and then and the disease. And if the relationship being established is uh, for two nutrients, um, we can think of an example, you know, like uh, calcium and vitamin D and osteoporosis. That's actually a, a authorized claim. But if we're lo looking at it as a qualified health claim, um, if we could look at the evidence uh, for those combined, and, and they're typically uh, uh, thought of working together, and, and the evidence supports that relationship, then yes, we can combine, we can have a, a qualified health claim where there are two nutrients as the substance or two foods as the substance um, and one disease. Um, but but most typically, you you would see that the bodies of evidence would, would be separate, and and if so, then we would then look at it as two separate claims. So it would really depend on the particular nutrient and, and, and the particular relationship being investigated. Thank you very much. So the next question um, has to do with gluten-free. And we see that on the label a lot. And how does that fall under health claims? So, um, well, so gluten-free is, is not, um, it does not fall under the, our, the realm of, of nutrition claims uh, in our regulations. Gluten-free is, is an ingredient type claim. And um, it, it doesn't fall under the regulations for health claims or those for nutrient content claims. Uh, Gluten-free has its, uh, as, a, as, a, as a term, as a, as a claim, has its own uh, requirements and, and regulations, and I don't actually have the, the citation in the CFR that has all their uh, requirements, but there are specific requirements for that claim um, and would not be found in the, in the section for uh, nutrition claims. All right, thank you. And we're moving on with the questions. Um, the next question um, has to do with wholesome food. Uh, so the question is, how can we communicate the role of wholesome food without being subject to being evaluated as a drug? And the example this questioner gives is nuts and weight management or diabetes and so on. Uh, so wholesome, wholesome is a term that, that can have um, a lot of meanings. When we were evaluating the term healthy um, years, <laughs> years ago, we, we looked at a lot of different terms that are used on, on food products that try to convey an overall sense of the food. Um, and wholesome act was actually one of them. Um, wholesome, it, depending on what the basis for making the claim wholesome is, um, it, it could or, or, or 
might not fall under the realm of nu nutrition claims. If it's wholesome based on its nutrient profile, the, based on the nutrients that are in there, uh, we could have evaluate it um, as, a, uh, as a nutrition claim. Uh, it could be also indicated as a wholesome product by perhaps some processing um, uh, characteristics, uh, for in ingredient characteristics, um, wh where it's made. So it would really depend on, on the context of using the word wholesome. Um, if, if it is based on the nutrient profile, then it could be looked at um, as, a, as a potentially an implied nutrient content claim, and we, we could investigate it in, in that way or evaluate it in that way, but um, it, would, it would really depend on the context that, that it's being used. Okay, our last question of the day uh, will also has to do with the term healthy, and it goes like this. Um, the current dish definition of healthy um, excludes things like nuts. I, this is what the uh, questioner says, uh, which would be contrary to so current scientific evidence uh, related to nuts and health. Uh, could you comment on the definition of healthy? Sure. Uh, when the requirements for healthy were, were decided um, and put into the regulations, uh, the the criteria were based on the, the current dietary recommendations at the time. Um, as, as the dietary recommendations for the public have evolved and have moved, um, we've started to reevaluate a number of our health claims and nutrient content claims to see if any of the requirements and criteria need to be updated. Um, certainly, uh, healthy has, has a lot of uh, potential for being looked at, uh, especially with nutrition facts and serving size being um, updated uh, currently, and and after that process is done, there, there's a lot of um, a potential for a number of the claims, including healthy, to be uh, updated. Uh, when it is um, looked at and evaluated, it, it's likely that a lot more foods would be able to fall into uh, qualification for for claims such as healthy, um, depending on how, how we shift uh, the threshold for the criteria if we take some of the uh, nutrient criteria out or if we add new ones in. Um, so so there, there's a lot of potential for um, updating of the claims in the, in the next few years. Well, thank you so much. We have uh, someone, I just want to clarify, someone asked, uh, do these um, nutrient content claims apply to infant formula? And then where can we find more information on the definition of healthy? And I'll just let you briefly uh, address those two questions, and then we will take our break. And I want to, you know, before I bring him back, I just want to thank him very much for this wonderful presentation. So, Vinny, you may answer those two. Infant formula okay. and... Also, um, infant formulas uh, in the United States are... are um, have their own set of regulations and, and laws that apply to those types of foods uh, and those populations. We do have the ability to have uh, claims that we approve for the general um, population for conventional foods and, and dietary supplements to apply also to infant formulas. Um, if, if we specifically have looked at the evidence for that and specifically include that in the regulation um, for um, uh, individual claims, most of the time, uh, the nutrient content claims and health claims that you see are not applicable to infant formulas. Um, you'll see a couple things uh, like uh, contains no iron, iron-free, something like that, or sugar-free. Uh, there's there's a couple that that do apply to infant formulas, but by and large, uh, unless we've specifically said that these claims would be applicable to infant formulas, then they would not, and, and that's typically the case. Um, and for more information on healthy, uh, that's the second question, um, I think on the first slide that I had for nutrient content claims, there was a, a link, um, it's on the first slide for nutrient content claims, and that actually takes you to what we call our food labeling guide, and that food labeling guide has an entire section uh, dedicated just to nutrient content claims, and there are actually multiple appendices for uh, the requirements for each of the claims and, and explanations for um, specific uh, nutrient content claims linked as well. So uh, you can actually take a look at that uh, food labeling guide 
to get more information on nutrient content claims such as healthy and also um, all the other types of claims that uh, we were discussing today. Thank you very much and we will resume our webinar at 1.25 Eastern Daylight Time. Thank you.